Hey, what is going on, you guys? Welcome to One of Each, the Dumb and Hungry podcast, where we talk about our food adventures and our favorite food groups. I'm Angelo, the Dumb and Hungry, and thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing all right. Hey, everyone. Uh, my Joe's dead to me because he's not available to record. Uh, he says he has like this perfectly valid reason, like he has to be somewhere and he can't be here. But I don't know. That's like not acceptable. You know, he has this contractual obligation that he needs to fulfill. You know, we've talked about this many times before, um, and yet he's still uh, bailing on us. So I don't know what the whole thing is about, but that's fine. In the meantime, uh, while he is dead to me, we have someone else to fill in the void. Someone with just as much loathing <laughs> well, but without further ado we're gonna bring him on right now and so i want to welcome everyone uh let's welcome my friend john john how are you i'm good how are you i'm doing all right thank you for uh for joining us and um you know Showing that my chow is uh, replaceable. Just <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to find loather number two. To exactly. Fill in. Well, yeah, I needed someone. Loather. Yeah, just with someone just as much, just as much of a uh, an energy. I think that my chow can bring. Um, maybe even more so to some extent. I don't know. So we'll see how this goes. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, thanks again. This is the um, first time, you know, we've done something like this. So I'm kind of excited. I'm also kind of uh, nervous maybe because I don't know what today is going to bring as to uh, you know, how this, <laughs> this conversation is going to go down. But um, hey, it gives us airtime and uh, gives us another episode. So I will take it. Um, to those to our uh, listeners or watchers, um, we have mentioned John from time to time. He probably doesn't know it because we probably talk about his back all the time, but we've <laughs> mentioned him from time to time. So this is John. <laughs> uh, finally, put a face, you know, to that name. Um, we've we uh we call we i call him my friend you know we are friends but probably <laughs> friend is a generous term i don't know <laughs> uh, i don't loather know he's, number two. that's right we'll just label that loather number two um but i wonder john you know uh we have known each other for quite a while um but i i want to see from your side if you can just kind of recall on how we know each other and how we kind of met um if you can kind of recall that Sure. So, first of all, I feel like I'm a bit of a substitute teacher today, where you've got some unknown person you've never met before running Rampage on your podcast. So, hopefully, I just show a video and we're good for today, and I'll just rest in the background. Um, how do we know each other? I mean, kind back into school, you know, Sir Dumb and Hungry and I attended the the OLA USC public school system and we met in I want to say was it was middle school yeah. yeah we were we were on a field trip I mean I think this is my earliest memory of you we were on a field trip and we were somewhere in downtown LA and we were I think we were at City Hall Mm -hmm. And it was lunchtime. And normally for field trips, at least prior to middle school, we had the budget to supply lunches for students. So I never had to worry about lunch. But mm -hmm. this is the first field trip I was on where, shockingly, there was no food available. So it's probably one of the worst field trips <laughs> in my in my book. <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah, I found myself... Foodless and and penniless, you know, and so short of starting to beg for money on the streets while this field trip was going on, um, Angelo kindly donated five dollars, which was a lot of money back then. I got you a lot of food at sure the old Carl Jr. Donated mm -hmm. five dollars towards my cost. So I was always like a homeless vagrant beggar, I guess. And Angelo was the guy on the street who pulls up at the freeway intersection and hands out money through his window. Mm. Uh, I think that was my first memory. I mean, obviously you didn't pull up in any vehicle of sorts at that time. Um, 
but yeah, you know, we bonded over food and just was a, was a, was a starting point for us. That's my memory. Is that more or less jive with what you recall? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it was just a bribe basically. It's like, please spend time with me. <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it, was a, it was a contractual exchange, right? You offered me consideration and return. I offered friendship. And a lifetime. <laughs> and a <kinship>. yeah. <laughs> what I didn't realize was that it was lifetime commitment. I should have bargained and negotiated. That's my first lesson in negotiation. So I know your worth because <laughs> you get locked into a lifetime contractual relationship for $5 not adjusted for inflation. Take notes. So here I am. Take notes. <laughs> Right, Michael's on Michael's on PTO. He's not right. even paid to do this, so he's just on TO. He just TO, yeah. and uh, here I am. It's fine. Fulfilling my my debt to this man. <laughs> I guess I could have just paid you back. But he also refused to take money, so it there was, you go. Well, there you go. I guess that's I guess that's an option. That's how we keep it going. This is how we keep this whole this whole thing yeah. going. So. Right, so hopefully you've bought more people under your tutelage uh, yeah. since then. But uh, not yeah, willing. I guess of associates. I guess I'm an associate. <laughs> <laughs> but not uh, willing to jump on a, uh, you know, whatever this is. But uh, that's fine. That's what makes you unique. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. And thank you again, everyone, for listening into, again, whatever this is. Um, let's continue <laughs> to catch up a little bit. Since we um, kind of last seen each other, actually, we saw each other not too long ago. We spent some time uh, with a few of our other friends. Um, we were uh, visiting the magical world of Disney. And um, we were there with um, uh, with Carmen. Carmen was there and uh, Chris and Clara. They, they were there with us as well. But we spent most of the day... Um, I don't know, eating, I guess. I don't know. Uh, that's really what ended up happening. So it was a pretty good, pretty good day. Uh, what do you remember from there? I mean, we just, well, we were, we were just wondering like first, like what, uh, we were going to do, I guess. I don't know what kind of activities, you know, were we going to do any rides, but I think it just ended up being more on eating. Yeah. I think the most magical thing about Disneyland is this magic trick they're able to do where money just disappears from your wallet over the course of the day. <laughs> and you're like, how did that happen? Yeah. Cause I think we spent most of the day spending money on food. Yeah. That was our, that was our Disney trip. We yeah. did, uh, we did, we, we got there, took our time, got there around 11 AM. And the first thing we did was straight to lunch. So we found ourselves at Hungry Bear, mm -hmm. where they were, you know, Disney's doing their 100-year anniversary as a company, not not the Disneyland theme park, but 100-year anniversary mm -hmm. as a, mm -hmm. as as a company. Enterprise. Right. right. Yeah. So they had promotional items at various restaurants. We visited Hungry Bear, where they were doing their potato cheddar cheeseburger, mm. which is almost like a double down, except... Instead of using meat patties, they use potato patties. Right. And then on top of that, they give you buns just to encapsulate the whole thing. Mm. So it was a regular cheeseburger. And then on both sides of that cheeseburger was two blankets of basically hash browns. Yeah. And a slathering of jalapeno cheese sauce. And then the bun, because if to call it a burger obligatory, they needed to give you some vehicle to hold it with. Mm. Um, so that was lunch. Quite That's heavy. how we started. <laughs> That's, That's how, how we started. started. Yeah. You know, we're like, let's tempt any ride. But before we do that, let's make sure to make ourselves feel <laughs> as sick as possible. So that when we get churning on the rides, <laughs> we'll be in a bad place. Um, yeah. So we did that. We did a, a ride, maybe. A we ride. Did, yeah. But we did the new runaway railway ride in the recently reopened Toontown. Yeah. That's a ride we brought over from, I want to say it's Hollywood Studios in Orlando. Mm. Um, and then what do we do? Is that when we got on your favorite ride right after that? <laughs> yeah, it's probably we the did, best ride. Yeah, arguably, so yeah. we did, 
we literally just did trains all day, right? Because <laughs> we got there and we took a tram. And that took us to the park. Mm -hmm. Then we ate. Right. And as we ate, we watched the train go by. Right. And then after we finished eating, we got on the runaway railway, which, which is a, basically a train. To, it's a train <laughs> that runs away. And then once we got found and got back to oh well we watched some unfortunate events in front of a bathroom mm. but then after that we got on another train right and we did the train to go around the park mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we did that for a loop and a half oh yeah which took about 45 minutes i think <laughs> at that's, that's that time slow. just flies by it's just like nothing <laughs> yeah you know you can catch so many pokemon on that train <laughs> And plan so many vacations on that train. I guess, yeah, I guess so. Um, That's true. I did wonder because we did repeat two or three of the stops. I did wonder if some of the folks there start to recognize it. Like, <laughs> they're really they're the still there. It's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how many times do you need to see prehistoric Earth? <laughs> um, yeah, so we did the loop and a half. And then honestly, I thought we just went to get food right after that. I mean, Maybe that's we stopped right. by a store or something. We could have. We could have. But then we got, we, we, yeah, we were able to snag a reservation at Lamplight Lounge, which is one of the restaurants over at the pier on the California Adventure side. It's a mm -hmm. reservation based system for dining. We were able to snag a reservation that day. And then we had dinner, yeah, early well, supper. Mm. I don't know. Um, another meal. Had another meal uh, right by the Incredicoaster along the water, freezing, very, very cold day. Um, and we did a bunch of drinks and had their lobster nachos, mm -hmm. and salmon poke, yeah. plus seafood foods. And they also had like a, a, a did they, what do they call it? A Kung Pao Bao? Is that what they called it? There's it's nothing Kung Pao about it. It was just pork belly. It was pork belly bao. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was. It's a misnomer. So if you order it, don't expect the Kong Pao. But uh, yeah, I, I think we we overate there. I started to feel sick, mm. and so we're like, we're too sick to do any rides. Right. So I think your solution was let's get cookies. <laughs> let's so, get dessert. But yes. Yeah, uh, let's get dessert. So we got cookies um, at I can never remember Jack Jack's. Is it Num Nums? I Num -nums? think so. Yeah. But next Something to the credit like coaster. Mm -hmm. Next to the credit coaster, yeah, it was like a deep dish chocolate chip cookie because why not? And a shortbread cookie. Mm -hmm. And then once we were done with that, I think you said, my meal isn't complete until I've had ice cream. <laughs> so then we went to get ice cream. And I was surprised. I thought we were just going to get, um, I thought we could just get a uh, soft serve by that place at the pier. Um, I forgot what, the abominable yeah. snowman thing. But they only yeah. have like um, the fruity flavored, you know, whatever yeah. it is. We just kind of. I think they used to do saucer. Oh, absolutely. Right ice cream. Yeah. Sorry, ice cream there, but because it was June gloom, they changed it to very sad fruit flavors. They were like, we're not standing for this. We're going to go get <laughs> American old fashioned vanilla. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So we, um, we ended up at the ice cream shop um, near the entrance of the, you know, DCA. And, um, well, I had a, a we rode the train out of there. That's... <laughs> so we literally did train, train, then a train of food appeared at our table, then train. Then we walked across the park for mm -hmm. another train of food right. to get on a train to return home. That sounds so, like a good day. I think we was well, <laughs> well spent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was a, uh, it was a, a gluttonous day. Yeah, as it usually is anyway when you're uh, when you're right. hanging out with the likes of us. So, I think we almost got one of each appetizer at Lamplight. Is that right? The one that we passed on was the Brussels sprout salad. No surprise. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we dodged. Should only be brown. That's we, that's what we were sticking to. At least we dodged that one. That's fine. Um, <laughs> we dodged that one. Yeah, but in the meantime, I mean, we in, in between we also. Um, had some of uh, the Dole Whip, right? Uh, and uh, oh my god, that's right. <laughs> that was good. I I, I enjoyed I, that. 
We ate so much. I literally can't remember at all. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it was a lot. Yeah. You probably want to like kind of repress some of those memories because it was just so, it was so much, but that's fine. I don't see a problem. <laughs> it's just, it was a good day. Right. That's all I can say. It was this a good is, day. This is the way, this is the way you do Disneyland. <laughs> Right. You saw how many people were stressed out on their apps. Like, oh my God, the wait time is 80 minutes now. Meanwhile, here we are. Oh, can we get a reservation? Here? Where's the churro stand? Oh, the churro stand? Why don't they have special churros? Yeah. <laughs> well, the churro we had that day was a churro like in. Uh... Oh my God, we had churros. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Covered in uh, powdered sugar. And also uh, a side of the, uh, like this guava cream cheese dip, which was quite good too. So, especially with cream cheese, you know, you know us with uh, cream cheese. It's quite nice. I've seen a, a meal or two where cream cheese was consumed excessively. Right. Almost exclusively. <laughs> <laughs> well, those, those are the dark days. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> they still might creep up now and then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Some people, some people have a bad day. I'll they'll just do a bottle of wine or they'll eat a tub of ice cream. Mm -hmm. I've never met you, people until you, you and my child yeah. will just do a block of cream cheese. <laughs> <laughs> just absurd. Yeah. Like just you eat it like a candy bar, I'd assume, made with a spoon. Well, it has a nice, proper it's nice, a soft, it has a nice soft texture, you know, so it's easy to just kind of get through and. Yeah, it's easy on the gums, right? It doesn't <laughs> exactly. Have it doesn't at all. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't they use that as baby food? I don't understand. <laughs> high protein, high fat content. The baby's so gross. Let's get on that. That, that would be a, a big hit, I think. So. There's a reason why you and I are not doctors. <laughs> there are numerous reasons for that, but that's uh, right. that is definitely one of them. Well, good. I'm I'm glad we had a. Sounds like we had a good time. Um, and I hope. Uh, Speak for yourself. I was oh. dying. It was so much. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot. I mean, it was. I mean, we were still thinking about getting that uh, that turkey leg, that sriracha turkey leg. At uh, I was not thinking about any turkey legs. <laughs> it certainly was. He was very tempted, as, thought, as was I. To me, when you guys said turkey leg, it felt like you were saying curse words because I was just so <laughs> tired of food. Every time you said sriracha turkey leg, I just heard F bombs. Or just like, yeah, we're speaking nonsense here. It's, um, well, we, um, we decided to, to save it for another time because I'm sure we'll be back and, uh, for another day of just overeating and riding the train. So, yeah, I think that turned out turned out pretty good. You think about it, we literally paid for the privilege to buy more food. <laughs> and then we just sat on trains. Yeah. Yeah. That's literally our whole day at Disneyland. So. <laughs> maybe we stayed for the fireworks. Fireworks, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they didn't have the show because it was a cloudy day. But maybe. They do them on Saturdays. They're like, no, we're good. We're just going to gonna train out of here <laughs> and some pepto bismol so um <laughs> yeah well that was our uh that was our day at, at disney and so that was that was a lot of fun and so hopefully more to come on that but yeah if you're ever at disney um those are just some of the fun things that we did and, and ate so um after that um uh, even though i was so full um just as you said um you know i uh I really couldn't, um, I didn't know what to do with that. So I ended up, um, eating more the next day. So, <laughs> so the next day, I your judgment so <laughs> poorly. What? I think, I think it's on track. It tracks pretty well. <laughs> right. It's like you're fixed to a food hangover as more food. It's this, the only uh, way. It's what they call positive feedback, right? It's it's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I couldn't get enough. So I um so the next day I met up with um some of our friends and we uh uh we went to a, a brewery um in Long Beach called Ambitious Ales and we've uh, in previous episodes we've mentioned them from time to time. A lot of um, pop ups come through there. A lot of great um, food uh, served out of there. 
along with uh, great beers, even though I'm not one to partake to all the time, but every now and again, um, I guess I will. But in this case, I did. But uh, at Ambitious Ales was a pop up uh, called uh, Dumplings. And Dumplings is, um, as the name kind of implies, uh, serves dumplings. And uh, this is what? actually, yeah, <laughs> would have thought, right? Um, but let me see if I can bring that up while I'm kind of bringing this. But but Dumplings is uh, owned by a, a gal named Jody. And Jody's actually a friend of, uh, of Jamie. And uh, it was Jamie who actually um, first uh, recommended and uh, mentioned this to me. So I have her to thank. And I had um, um, picked up food from her before. She had done some like kind of uh, pickups in, near her area in Studio City or, you know, near there. And um, she uh, but she's been just kind of doing a lot more pop ups and doing that rotation. So she if you check out her, you know, Instagram, it's, uh, you know, at uh, stuffed underscore dumplings, uh, you'll kind of see the schedule that you know, she kind of is laid out. Um, she has pop-ups kind of lined up almost every week or so. And, um, I was just lucky that she was down closer to Long Beach, um, you know, uh, recently. So she makes some really great dumplings. I mean, you know, um, obviously there's no shortage of jump dumplings in areas like the SUV and Chinatown and all that. But I think the way she's just making some real good, high quality, you know, stuff. Um, just some of the things that kind of stood out. Um, we had, uh, like she, she's, she's made this uh, thing called the Holy shiitake. And, um, it's just this really nice meaty, like mushroom, shiitake mushroom, you know, with, you know, chopped vegetable and it's just, and, and, uh, pan fried. So you have this nice crispy bottom with, um, lined with sesame as well. So there's like kind of this nice crunch there. And, um, it's, uh, that was a very memorable, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even meat. Can you believe it? And uh, it's something that I uh, really ended up enjoying. So I don't. So that was um, that was what they call the the holy shiitake. And then there was another flavor too. Uh, I forgot the exact name. Was, but was it, that your Was that your guilt for not having the Brussels sprouts the day before? You're like, I should have a vegetable of some kind. Yeah. But it needs to be wrapped <laughs> in some carbohydrate and it's pan fried. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, it just helps uh, create balance, right? I mean, balance is important in life, so this is... Right, yeah. Right, a whole bowl of Brussels sprout leaves. It's too much. No, it's, it's... way off balance. That really is way off balance, but this really hits the spot, I got to tell you right now. So that uh, that was good. Um, but uh, another flavor that kind of stood out was this, uh, this curry, and uh, it was... I forgot the exact name of the flavor, but it was based on... Um, on Steph Curry, I mean, I mean, just kind of the play what? on the name, not, oh. not yeah, not cannibalistic oh, or anything. I'm just talking about like, <laughs> Steph Curry like okay. but it was, uh, it was just a sweet gold championship rings inside. Yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but it was, uh, it was like a nice sweet curry, very kind of Japanese like, um, and, but you know, all that flavor and, uh, put into a, you know, uh, a fried uh, dumpling wrapper and it was kind of nice and almost surprising that you could have something like that because obviously curry is you know um more not solid <laughs> so i guess yes it can be tough to um to enclose it, it is some... certainly more not solid i agree <laughs> Good, I'm glad. i mean it Good. sounds like a um sounds like a ravioli almost you could almost think about it like that right like um, a sweet potato ravioli except curry so yes yes but but it really hits i mean the spot as far as like getting that curry flavor um you know in a dumpling so she did that really well so if ever um you know i i noticed that you know she's at these uh at these breweries uh benny boy and hops merchants you can uh, hops merchants actually in uh, north hollywood if um you don't know and so she'll be popping up there and um between that and benny boy so if you're in those areas you can check them out and um that would be a good place to uh to spend um a weekend i guess you know anyway but that's a uh, weekend <laughs> if you want to sure i w- i would if i could if they're not close you can just hang out you there, just hang just out there. <laughs> even after everyone leaves after they close the tabs it's like what? Right, they just shut you inside <laughs> lock the door you gotta scrounge for food 
Yeah, just going at the scraps. It's like. Um... <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned you had a beer with the dumplings. How does that pair? Did you enjoy that pairing? Um, you know, I, I just know that it was uh, it was good. I I don't really uh, pay attention, I guess, to the flavors. I guess that it brings out. Um, but. Usually I take uh, usually drink lighter beers and those that are like more fruity, maybe sour. So I think that's what I had in that case. It was like this berry kind of sour uh, beer. Um, I enjoyed it. So it was just I'm- an obstacle for you to get. Oh, okay, you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like I have to get to this first, me right? And my dumplings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> I need to be socially accepted, right. but I'm really here for the dumplings. <laughs> Right. Or is there a cover charge where you can't eat at that bar unless you get a beer? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, people um, who listen here know uh, pretty well that uh, usually I, I'm very, fa- I'm more familiar with breweries only because of these pop ups. So I probably <laughs> wouldn't have gone, you know, the otherwise. <laughs> Look, that's cool. It exposed you to another world that you didn't spend a lot of time in. So. Yeah, exactly. And it's crazy. Like these breweries, I mean, even each, like the whole brewery, you know, so a whole community itself, it's like uh, people that know each other, at different breweries. And then even there are, you know, groups of people within the breweries themselves, uh, regulars and everything. It's just a really interesting, um, you know, group of people and, and crowd. Um, and it's nice. It's it's nice to very relaxing and, and uh, a nice time to a place to be at. So. Um, yeah, so pop-ups like these kind of naturally just have something, you know, to pair with, you know, something to eat, something to drink. Cause a lot of these breweries, you know, uh, a number of them might have kitchens, um, that they would have served food out of, but I think it works out a little better to rotate different, um, vendors and pop-ups, uh, through. So ambitious, ambitious ales is a great example of, um, of someone that does that. So and dumplings, of course, is a great example of one of those vendors that comes through. So uh, hopefully more to more to come. So hopefully we'll try that out together. I don't know. But um, again, if you're ever within any of those vicinities, please give them a visit. That sounds too ambitious and it ails me to think about it. Yeah, you, know, you might need to. But areas like, you know, NoHo or East LA or whatever might be more in your alley. Uh, yeah, so here we are. Speaking of more food, thank you again, everyone, for joining us as we talk about our uh, food adventures, our local spots and pop-ups uh, with good food and good people. You know, today is a little different. Um, we're actually not staying local as uh, as we usually do. We're actually going to venture off a little bit and visit the international scene, uh, courtesy of uh, John here. I... Um, you know, when I'd asked him to kind of join for today, I um, kind of had in mind that maybe he'd be willing to kind of share some of his um, his thoughts and uh, things that he's enjoyed lately. Um, and so lately, I don't know if I, I'll just kind of say that, you know, you had, uh, you had a nice time recently uh, visiting um, outdoors. Wait, that's not right. Uh, but out the <laughs> First time leaving your house is what I'm right. hearing. Well, I mean, effectively, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you do the same when you go out to eat. Right, yes. You're, you're, you're leaving your place. That's the great outdoors, as we call it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you tell the people, John, then uh, what you've been up to lately and what you uh, what we've uh, kind of asked you to share today. So I guess my great outdoor that I visited, uh, we were lucky enough to be able to go to Italy. Mm. We went mid-May. Uh, we visited a handful of cities. So first off, we went to Rome. Um, and then we followed that up with Florence and then stopped at a seaside town called Cinque Terre. We stayed there for actually three nights. And then uh, one day in Milan, or one afternoon in Milan, and then came back home. Very nice. So we spent quite a bit of time over there. I think it was 12 nights. I could be wrong. I didn't help to plan any of it. I was really there along for the ride. So I I, I really don't know. I'm still trying to remember what the itinerary was, because I was just there to experience it. I was fortunate my wife and her sister and my Mm brother-in-law planned it all. 
Yeah. My job was to learn Italian. And then, so, you know, I spent a lot of time doing that. Did you? A lot of Duolingo. Okay. A lot of words that I did not need, right? Because it wasn't teaching me to be a conversationalist per se. It was Mm. teaching me how to say things like, that's my cookie. (laughs) Yeah. I need That's that. A monkey. I think I need right, that in yeah. my vocabulary. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully the local Italian people aren't taking your cookies that you need to ask for it back. But yeah, I found out that a lot of, you know, in Rome, especially, there's a lot of students mm-hmm. out doing study abroad programs. And when we were walking through the neighborhood, we were staying in a town or in a part of town called Trastevere. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that area, there was a lot of students, a lot of young um International students, a lot of them from the States, you could tell by the way they spoke. Uh, but it was really strange because you were walking around this very old historical area and all you heard was American English. Oh, interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. So it didn't feel like we were too far other than the surrounding, you know, the atmosphere. Everything around us was very American. Yeah. And Florence had a lot of students too, but it was much, felt more dense. Uh, at least based off the area we were staying. So you saw a lot of folks, a lot of visitors, a lot of locals. Um, and then Cinque Terre was, was felt more Italian. Uh, it's a smaller seaside town. Hmm. I think we saw well, there was either 400 to 700 local inhabitants across yeah. the five towns, and then the rest are tourists. So easily flanked on all sides by tourists. But it's just become tourist towns, right? That's what their local economies rely on. Mm. is visitors uh, so a lot of restaurants um, some experiences you can do uh, a lot of gelato sh- i mean a lot of gelato shops everywhere gelato shops to italy are like the bakeries to france right it's like every other store is a gelato shop i didn't look it up but it did feel like there must have been some kind of municipal requirement that if you're going to open a store you need to have you need to be flanked on both sides by gelato shops mm. so they were they were in plenty uh, but yeah, that was our trip. Uh, it was a it was a good eating adventure, right? So Italy is known for the Holy Trinity, the three Ps. They've got pizza, mm-hmm. pasta, and mm. paninos Ooh. sandwiches. Mm. Um, so we definitely indulged in the trifecta. Obviously, gelato too, but they named it with a G, so it is family trinity. But that's that's like a, a finisher, right? You finish your meal, you go get gelato. Yeah. Or if it was you, you start your day with a gelato and <laughs> have gelatos throughout the day. Right? It's like, oh, I caught my train. Let's have a gelato. Yeah, right, exactly. it's a little celebration, <laughs> right? <laughs> I found my Airbnb using Google Maps. How do you get a gelato? So we weren't quite that extreme, oh, you know, we, we had, we had other things in the agenda. We went to right. the Vatican, very, very busy. Mm. Um, saw some paintings that I did not realize were in the Vatican, but we saw them in our textbooks growing up. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't recall them for you, but, uh, yeah, very impressive. You know, Rome had a lot of history, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the sites that you see in your textbooks or romanticized in movies, Fast and Furious 10, a lot of mm. Shala scenes uh, what? <laughs> in Rome. They actually had their premiere in Rome. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. And so we went out there shortly after they were out there. And, yeah. and thank God we didn't. We weren't there for that because they, they looked like they more or less shut down the Coliseum to be the premiere. Um, yeah, it was just very cool. We had to walk around Rome and it's just about everywhere you went, there was some kind of historical site that survived through hundreds and not thousands of years and are still standing today. And, you know, they're, they're impressive to observe and in between them are somewhat modern to modern stores and living situations. So it's very much uh, a very old city embedded with old history. I think as a result of, of all that history, there's very few, I mean, it's not a very big town to begin with, but there's, there's no real good subway system per se. There's two lines that will get you around that you do rely heavily on, on walking and on mm-hmm. buses, but that's not why you brought me here. You just want to know about the food. So maybe I should just <laughs> move off this topic. Forget the history. What do they eat? What do they eat? <laughs> well, that's part of history too. Mm-hmm. History and culture, you know? Right. Yeah. That's the main, isn't that the main component of culture is food is food. That's right. That's how you learn. I don't know what else, what else makes up culture. They talk about work culture and it's just food, isn't it? That's right. Exactly. 
Well, yeah, why don't you bring us, uh, kind of run us through uh, the many different things that you ate, um, you know, place, you know, around the places they were. And yeah, I mean, just what you remember uh, would be would be a good way to go about it. Uh, well, you're asking for at minimum 36 meals to recount if we were there for 12 nights. We got all night. Sorry, I, got I, got, I got time. <laughs> plus two airplane meals, plus two layover meals. So. Got a lot to go through. Um, let's see. I have to boil it down. <clears throat> we should uh, We should just start with pasta. Yeah, they're known for pasta. Uh, we have a lot of Italian brands that you can buy in our grocery stores here. Barilla is a huge, prolific brand in our grocery stores. And Barilla is big there in, in Italy, too, mm. but we didn't eat any of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> we had we had what the locals are making. Uh, but pasta in Italy is it's hard to describe. I mean, it's, it's the perfect al dente. Mm. Um, it's got very flavorful sauces that accompany it. Um, it's, there's all kinds of shapes. We, we had a lot of peachy, so P I C I. Okay. Peachy. Okay. And then you can think of it almost as between a spaghetti and an udon noodle. It's mm. somewhere in that happy medium, but it's, it's a pasta noodle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they use it to make carbonara. They use it to make a matriciana. Uh, you can get, I mean, it's just about any sauce. It's almost like pick your pasta. Pick your sauce, boom, wow. we can make it for you. Mm. So it's a very uh, versatile, seems, uh, type of... It's a very versatile food, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the most mind-blowing thing was, you know, I think we're, we're fortunate uh, having a currency that's still fairly strong at this stage and living a, a West Coast rate uh, wage. When you go to Italy, it feels quite affordable. We're, I was expecting to send... 15, 20, 30 dollars, right. what I would spend here in the States right. for pasta. Mm-hmm. But over there, it was seven to 10 euros, which is wow. eight to 11 dollars. Right, right. For some of the best pasta you've ever eaten. And it's like you can go to just about any restaurant and get a solid pasta. Get the same. That's not 100% true. Check TripAdvisor. But well, I felt, it certainly felt that way. Yeah. There's restaurants everywhere. You know, they're not, a lot of restaurants aren't necessarily big restaurants. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there's no, there's no Olive Garden of Italy. It's just a little mom and pop shops. Um, some chains. Uh, yeah, definitely the pastas are a standout. Yaki, they had a great, Yaki, Yoki. Yoki, sure. Gnocchi. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh, we had a, a truffle based gnocchi in mm-hmm. a cream sauce. That was delicious. Uh, I mean, our very first night we started off with pasta. So, you know, we, we landed, um, got our bearings, got to our Airbnb, and then walked over to this restaurant called Mimi e Coco Trust, which okay. Trust is just short for Trust the Bear, the area that we were in. Oh, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was busy. It was really busy. Uh, I think it was 8 p.m. And there was these, these uh, we walked by in you know, the area. It's just residential or restaurants at the bottom. Uh, very narrow streets fits one car. Uh, and then every car that we saw parked on the streets had damage on the front bumper what? and the back bumper. Like they are all parked bumper to bumper. Wow. Corners are really tight. People are really good mm-hmm. at driving through those areas without hitting people, mm. but they're not so good about hitting objects. So just about every car was scuffed. <laughs> in that area i think they you know there's less there's less care i think yeah because it, it, you just expect if you're going to drive through that area it's going to get damaged so you're not going to spend the time on it to fix it because it's going to happen again yeah uh, but yeah very small streets uh great for walking um uh, but this first restaurant mimi at coco there was it was our first restaurant I had to put my duolingo italian to the test Did it? and where's my cookie and, well i didn't i ended up not <laughs> all right I showed up and I, the first thing I asked for, that's my cookie. It wasn't even asked, it was a statement. Um, the very first thing I asked was, uh, okay, we have a table for two. Mm. And it turns out you don't learn that in Duolingo. So at the end of the day, I ended up on Google Translate anyway. <laughs> Typing in, can I get a table for two or for four? Sorry. Four, yeah. um, so they told us, yeah, it was about a 15, 20 minute wait. So sure, no problem. 
uh, hung around, took a look at their menu. Uh, and I think we ended up waiting about 45 minutes before wow. we got seated. It's a small restaurant. It's mm-hmm. very, very small on the inside, maybe like seven to the eight tables. Um, and then on the outside, there was about four to five tables, but they weren't really seating people outside because it was raining. There was light rain. When we got seated, they, they were super apologetic for making us wait. And I was like, wow, this is very strange. I was very appreciative that they were apologetic, but I wasn't expecting it at all. You know, mm-hmm. I'm used to dining out here in the States where they'll tell you it's 30 minutes and then you wait a day and a half and then right. all your tables ready. Yeah. And then that's the end of that conversation. Uh, yeah, they were very, they were very nice and very apologetic. And they, you know, for our inconvenience, they gave us all a glass of white wine to start off our meals. Mm. We're an ally. I, I knew we were in a different place. Yeah. As soon, you know, you don't have to tip for service. You don't tip for, it's not a thing you do in Italy. You don't tip for uh, service. Right. The, pri- just, the price there is what you see is what you're paying, right? What you I mean. see is what you pay. Yeah. But even despite not having to quote unquote earn the service, they're still mm-hmm. very hospitable, yeah. very kind. Um, so it was a great first meal. That's where we had our cotter manata and our amatriciana and pichi. Um, I mentioned there's three peas. There's the pasta, the pizza, and the panino. Yeah. What I didn't mention is the pince. Pince. Pince, pince is it, it's almost like a flatbread pizza, but it's I mean at least the one that we had I wouldn't call pizza because so pince is just a style of quote unquote pizza. Uh-huh. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time researching this. I hope you're on the background now <laughs> doing the research that I did not prepare. <laughs> but it's a um, it's a flatbread, mm-hmm. and so it's hand stretched and it's 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 usually some kind of oval shape and what was unique about this restaurant was when we we're going through the menu it said raw and then it said rocket salad which is the translation for arugula mm. yep that looks pretty pince close to what we had um nice so we had yeah it was it said raw rocket salad buffalo mozzarella olive oil and I forget what the other thing was. And we're like, mm. it seems kind of strange to say it's quote unquote raw. Uh, but, you know, whatever. Maybe they're just alluding to the freshness of the ingredients. Yeah. Um, no, raw means raw. <laughs> uh, in, 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 in translation, it, we, we learn. Oh, great. When the, uh-huh. the, the, the pince showed up, right? I mean, the, the crust is cooked. So mm. it's a flatbread that was baked. But then you had these cubes of buffalo mozzarella, just chunks yeah. of buffalo mozzarella. You got your salad, uh, your your arugula, your rocket salad, uh, olive oil, and it was just it was a very basic, very light food. You know, the the crust is not greasy at all. Um, everything's very fresh, but something about eating fresh bread with unmelted cheese just mm. felt wrong. Really, we were expecting a pizza. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one uh, I won't name names, but one of us described the cheese as soft tofu that was just bouncing around okay. and just couldn't even keep it on. Couldn't even keep it on. You know, as soon as you oh, right. that crust, it's, right. it starts rolling. Because it's not away. baked on there. It's just like, it's just kind of topped on. on. It's yeah. In, yeah. It's oh. literally like they took, you know, a bulb of, 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 probably not the right term, but a ball of mozzarella and put it into quadrants and was like, bam, this, this is pince. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't a great introduction. It wasn't a good, you know, kind of gave us a bit of a rocky start for, yeah. for pizza and Rome. Yeah. And then on top of all that, it tasted very healthy. So did was, that uh, not, was, not bode well with you? <laughs> no, did not, did not, did not bode well for this Americanized palate. Oh, um, and that's actually something that we noticed with a lot of Italy actually was the pizzas. Yeah. We're used to eating a certain style of pizza here in the States. Like yeah. I think, there's some kind of fat that's incorporated into the crust here. Mm, you got really greasy mm-hmm. yeah. uh, toppings and, and all these things. And the pizzas in Italy just didn't have that. It, they were cleaner. They definitely tasted cleaner. Yeah. But we had, we had calzones. We had Neapolitan style pizzas. We had pince. We had another pince just to give another shot another night. Uh, but the, the pizzas are just not quite what you're used to having here. Mm. And, you know, I think it takes a little bit of getting used to, at least for us, 
takes a little bit of getting used to because you're so used to a certain style and taste and flavor yeah. profile and texture yeah. profile here. Um, I didn't find it bad, but it's different. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I still enjoyed it. It still tasted fresh. You know, they've got great cured meats in Italy. So yeah. their, their prosciutto was was very, very good. They really enjoy uh, mortadella, which they use on a lot of their sandwiches and on their pizzas. It's it's a type of ham. Um, salami. Some of the best salami we've ever eaten. Actually, no. What am I saying? The best salami we've ever eaten. <laughs> right? Because the salami you get here, especially the store-bought salami, has some firmness to it. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a waxy uh, exterior. Right. And when you bite into it, it's almost like you got to fight the salami. It's almost like a pounded out Slim Jim you're fighting through. Whereas in Italy, I mean, these, the salami was so tender and it was super easy to, to, to work your way through and very tasty, tasted very fresh. Um, hands down best salami I've ever had it was just Italy in general. It wasn't any one place. Yeah. They all had great salami if they had salami. Um, but yeah, the pizzas are are different, and I still enjoy them. Um, but I think people may feel a bit disappointed. I think most of our group, excluding me, was a bit disappointed by the pizzas there because it just doesn't ha- offer the same punch as the pizzas here do. But then, as a side effect, you know, you have a pizza here, you hate yourself, you're tired, you're lethargic, you right. go to bed because right. you can no longer function conversing is difficult um whereas you have a pizza in italy like i don't know it, it just felt much cleaner and you didn't i none of us got a lot of us on the trip were lactose intolerant and despite there being cheese and we had gelatos and we had milk-based products tiramisu you named it none of us really felt any side effects from that and same thing with the pizzas, you know, when you have a pizza here, it's greasy, it's a messy affair, it's tasty, and then you regret it afterwards. There was no real opportunity for regret, but it also didn't quite taste the same. So that was the trade-off. But it was very fresh, uh, and you could keep going after that. You didn't have to end your day because you had a pizza, Yeah, what I'm trying to say. Interesting. That's so. great. I mean, um, again, it sounds like you said it's, it's a different... Um, yeah, it's a different uh, experience, a different, um, you know, uh, approach, I think, to what we expect pizza to be here in in, uh, in the States. Um, but, I mean, it's it, it came from there, right? I mean, that's where pizza came from, imagine. That's what, that's what they say. And then America the thought, then America thought, no, this is not going to work. Let's just, uh, yeah, it's like, this is all wrong. You need to stuff the crust, you need to stuff the crust. Right? and then you might as well stuff the whole thing <laughs> and then bake it in a baking, in a, in a cake pan <laughs> and then stack the toppings, right? And then find other things besides cured meats to put into it. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's how we do it. And butter. Right. You know, absolutely. Your deep dishes are just, it's just a beautifully baked butter dress that you stuff with cheese and goodness. And <laughs> I think if anybody in Italy saw that, they would reel in disgust and <laughs> throw that thing out the window. So That's right. That's right. This is a very different stuff. We did have a pizza. It was a Roman style pizza. It's called Pizzeria Bonci, mm-hmm. and it's B O N C I. Mm-hmm. Highly reviewed um, pizza spot in in Rome uh, and they do pizza by the slice so pizza al talia mm-hmm. I'm probably butchering that thanks to Um and you know you 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 literally order you tell them how much to cut off of this I mean it's gonna sound unappetizing because I already just said pizza was not good but it's like a <laughs> giant pizza it's just a massive pizza that they've made yeah um, it reminds me of Detroit style pizza. It's got a very fluffy uh, crust, and yeah. then the bottom has a very nice crisp to it, uh, but not as not as greasy for a reason. So, again, same thing. They they sell it um, uh, by you, you. They basically are sitting there with scissors, just kitchen oh, yeah. shears, cutting mm-hmm. these pizzas for you, and then they'll throw them on their scale and they sell it by the pound or oh. by the kilogram. So you so you just kind of specify like I kind of want a piece this size or you attempt to specify because there wasn't real signage as you can see in those pictures. So you're mm-hmm. like, 
Yeah. What is all this? And they take their time. They'll explain to you what the various slices are. Mm. Um, so we had, we had a spattery, we had a, a small menagerie. Wow. Um, of pizzas to try. We had that one. Oh, really? The one on the right. And That's what is that? Uh, okay. it's their, it's their ham. Mm-hmm. And then the one on the left, I mean, that looks almost like, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure it's not pasta, but it looks like retrieval pasta. Almost does. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it is. It looks like a julienne uh, kind of vegetable in there, I think. Yeah, they did have some interesting uh, vegetables, and I don't know it was just because of language barrier. But one of the one of the pizzas had a heaping pile of greens all the way across, and we asked them what kind of pizza they what said or pizza it was, and they they said it was chicory. Chicory. Which I didn't look that up, but it's it was a green vegetable. Uh, it looks like a flower. What is, what is, I mean, from what? I'm... Okay, well, it wasn't. It wasn't flower at all. So. So clearly, it was. A, a I mean, language, it's an uh... it's an herb, but I mean, like, it looks like it's sprouting flowers here. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those ones are probably not ready for eating. It's probably past past you. Should have eaten it earlier. Um, but yeah, I did enjoy that one a lot. It's, they weren't as flavorful. Again, it's like I think the salt isn't as heavy. Mm. Uh, the grease is not as heavy. And even at this place, there wasn't a lot. We had one that was a tomato-based sauce. Any yeah. of the tomato-based sauce wasn't that tomato-y, which was kind of surprising. But there were other pizza places that had more, quote-unquote, tomato-y, you know, San Marzano-style yeah. mm-hmm. um, crushed tomatoes on their pizzas. Those were much better. But again, all very light. Wow. So Except I mean, for Banchi. That was probably the heaviest pizza. Oh, okay. Okay. But, you know, so a place like Banchi does... That remind the only parallel I can make, you know, with this experience is like, um, you know, Triple Beam, right? I mean, they have that same kind of format. You know, it's kind of long, elongated pizza. You kind of, yeah, you kind of get, you know, whatever size piece or whatever that you want. Right. But obviously, still yeah. the the flavor and the taste is, you know, different here, right? Than than there. Yeah. But I think there's uh, just more richness in our our pizzas. Mm. probably not good for us overall and that's probably why we feel so crappy after having pizza yeah but i think that's really what the the biggest difference was was there's just so much more fat content in our pizzas mm. yeah we managed to give it the the uh gosh what is that place called the uh the cheesecake factory treatment where you try to figure out how to get as many calories as you can into one slice. It's yeah. almost like a competition. Like yeah. if I can just squeeze in another 3000 calories, this can be the best pizza this person ever has. <laughs> it was less of that. And then we, there was no cheesecake factory effect, which probably for the better. And, you know, people generally in Italy are, are look like they were more fit. Mm-hmm. Granted, it is a walking city. All, yeah. all other cities are walking cities. So uh, you get a little bit more exercise. Amazing, but yeah, I think it's it's similar to Triple Beam, mm-hmm. um, a, a long elongated Detroit style pizza. Detroit, man, you're really stuck on that minus, Detroit style. I mean, minus minus the cheese crust. There's right. no cheese crust. No cheese crust. That's too bad. That's too American, right? <laughs> Again, that's the cheesecake factory effect. How do I incorporate more calories into this calorically dense dish? Oh, I know. Let's bake a cheese crust into it. <laughs> Oh man, that's the American way. So, next one. Right. Well, what else? Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. So, so we've talked about a little bit of pasta. We've talked some um, pizza as well. Um, yeah. What else? What else uh, comes to mind? Uh, well, the other P of the trifecta is panino mm-hmm. sandwiches, uh, and you know, I think there's different interpretations of sandwiches. There's obviously the Italian style sandwich you get here in the States where it's some kind of soft bread, a bunch of cold cuts, yeah, the vinegar dressing and, and greens. Yeah. None, none of that exists. Or at least I didn't see any, yeah. any Italian style sub in Italy. A lot of those sandwiches in, especially we were, we had them um, in Florence tend to consist of uh, a flat bread. Um, kind of looks like a focaccia, but it's not greasy. So yeah, I didn't look up what kind of bread it was. Um, probably a, a place you can look up is um, Al Antico's, A L and A N T I C O. Mm-hmm. Vinale. Okay. V is in Victor. I N A I O. Yeah. Um, that's probably one of the biggest sandwich chains out there. 
uh, in Florence, they've got a location that's literally three, sh three full size sh side by side. Uh, oh, really? With like full that. service counter. Mm -hmm. And then across from them is another full size shop that belongs to the same sandwich shop. So they've got four sandwich shops in the same area. <laughs> Frank out the lines because there's there's a ton of people. A really, lot of the traffic really. Is this place. Yeah. So you can see, yeah, and that bread. Yeah, it's like a flat bread type thing. It's it's not a rich bread by any means. It's, yeah. it's quite light, um, very toasty. Maybe mm. like a, a elevated saltine factor, and it's better than that. But <laughs> okay. um, uh, and then they just dress it with. Various cold cuts, um, again, but the mortadella, salami, uh, they've got prosciutto. Uh, what else do they have? I mean, it was, it was just a whole variety of, of cold cuts. And it's like the Jersey Mike's of, of Italy. You really? Know, you've, got, <laughs> you've got huge cuts of meat just in the display. Yeah. Uh -huh. And there's someone uh, at the counter, right. Bear in mind, these are really small restaurants. So oh my God. There's someone at the counter literally just, I don't know where this is. I didn't see this. They are just shaving, uh, fresh cold cuts. Yeah. Um, so you go up, you know, they welcome you, they ask you what you want you list off your sandwich and then they just pull out the orders and they start making them. And as the sandwiches are done, they just yell out the sandwich name. And if that's one you ordered, you reach for it. Um, so we had one that was, I think it was called Fabuloso, mm -hmm. and it was truffle cream with salami or prosciutto, with some cold cuts, uh, rocket salad. They're a big fan of rocket salad, which is arugula. Um, and I think it had even like an eggplant spread, you know, but there's all kinds of, of mixes of things in these sandwiches, and they were pretty solid. Uh, I did look up, so the sandwiches, again, just like the pizzas, just like the pastas, everything relatively very affordable to Yeah to the cost of, of dining out here in LA. And again, no tipping, no taxes, no right. mandatory right. health charge on top of everything. It's just, this is the menu price, this is what you pay. If you're sitting at a restaurant, there might be a coperto, which is a cover charge. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. intended to cover things like your silverware and napkins and tablecloths and things like that. And that's just a cover charge per person and it's between two to four euros. Yeah. But otherwise, like a glass of wine is five to seven euros if it's a house wine. And even getting a bottle for the table is, I think, about, we saw wines as low as 10 to 20 euros. Wow. Um, there's no such thing as a corkage fee. You know, you go to a, a restaurant here and it's like, hey, I brought my own bottle of wine. You might open it. Yeah. yeah, it costs $30 to right. open that bottle of wine and give you glasses. Whereas yeah, right. that, that doesn't really exist in Italy. We told that to one of our, we did a bike tour and we were talking to our, our tour guide and we told her about the corkage fees that we pay here. And she literally just stared at us and just gave us a WTF look. Yeah. She's like, yeah. that's unheard of. I would never pay somebody to cork, uncork my wine for me. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's just social norms that we're used to having out here that doesn't exist out there. But mm -hmm. anyways, I digress. So uh, the sandwiches are just like the pastas, they're very affordable. They were between six to nine euros. And then if you want to splurge on one, I think those one for 10 euros, which again, about 1.1 conversion factor, it was seven to $11 for a big sandwich. It's the size of a large format flat tablet. It's probably the best. They're like a, they're like a 12 inch laptop. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty sizable. I mean, is, is that the best form factor I can think of right now? Yeah. And a 10 to 12 inch laptop. That That's pretty yeah, big. It, yeah. It was no joke. Yeah. You could definitely hurt someone if you hit them with that sandwich. Uh, substantial, not very, you know, not very stuffed as mm -hmm. you can see in the picture, um, but just really fresh cold cuts, nice smears, uh, fresh vegetables. But again, lack of lethargy once you've consumed it. Um, this is probably, that's one of the most popular sandwich shops in Italy. It's probably one of the most well known. Some people say it's overrated. I enjoyed them for the most part. There was one I wasn't a big fan of, but otherwise generally enjoyed them. Um, there were other sandwich shops that I didn't get to try that some, you know, one of our, our group was able to try and they did say that was, they had some better sandwiches out there. Uh, but Alantico's has popped up here in LA at Pizzeria mm. Mozza a couple of oh, times at Mozza okay. Go, okay. And they've sold yeah. out each time. So there, it's kind of a proof of concept for them to figure out 
where they can uh, pop one up. I think they're planning to open a location rumored to be in K-Town this nice. year. Okay. But I haven't seen any updates. Um, they have two locations, I want to say, in New York. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but the sandwiches in New York are 16 to $20. Of course. And right. I wouldn't be surprised if the price point is somewhere around there here in LA. Like, yeah, on, and then you still have to around. add tax and tip and all those other right. things, right? Yep. Yeah. So the fee for wrapping the sandwich up for you. Yeah. Uh, so, and but, so it'll be interesting to see what that business model looks like when it comes over here. But yeah, there's an opportunity for us to have some. So you don't good. have to go all the way to Italy, although I suspect it's not going to be identical. But No, of hey, course. I, not, I mean, not I don't... Only. This this is a kind of a tangent, but I I feel like, you know, in some people might take it in a pessimistic way, like you know, L A um, doesn't always have like standout food, or you know, maybe quality is maybe not. You know, if you go overseas, you go international, whatever, like all the food you have, there's probably the the best you've ever had, right? And what we have in the states, you know, again, it might get you bloated, or you know, might get you, you know, just feel something different, but. I think in an optimistic sense, like it's amazing what type of food you can find in LA, particularly because there's just so many types of cuisine that you can find within, you know, the city radius. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, maybe other, maybe smaller spots and towns might just have a lot of, I don't know, maybe a few good spots and a lot of fast food chains, right? Not that we don't have those here, but, um, I think that you can find, you know, different types of food uh, in a street corner or something or popping up somewhere. It's, um, I think it just showcases, it just, uh, you know, has LA showcase, I guess, as a, as a great way to, uh, experience different types of food and culture. So I don't know. That was just kind of what I was thinking about that. Um, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. You can definitely get a, an incredible variety of food in LA and their quality items as well right i think the the biggest difference you'll notice when you go to italy it's just it's just in general it's different from what you're used to having here in la yeah. and i think that's part of the charm of what makes it taste so much better is that you know they've got different sources of water they've got different varieties of vegetables you're growing so even though it's it's very recognizable mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. eyes will say hey this is pasta it just tastes very different because the components that go into it are are different from the things that you can get here locally and maybe they're they're, they're ingredients that you can find at your farmer's market but you know who's spending the time going there to fix themselves a nice italian style meal at the farmers using farmers market ingredients so i think that's probably where the biggest difference is is it's just the source of where their food comes from and i think there's something to be said about their you know their philosophy is very much farm to table things are fresh mm -hmm. um you know there's I mean, I, I'm sure they deal with the same thing we deal with. If major grocery stores have distribution channels, grocery, you know, produce has to sit on shelves or sit in trucks before they make it out uh, to the stores. But I think the amount of time that they're in transit and the amount of big produce that's in Italy compared to here, maybe not as substantial or the timelines to get them into the city are not substantial or even the pesticides they use could be a whole factor of thing. You know, we didn't, we didn't go and do a bunch of research. We just knew that after a meal, we were ready to go to do the next thing. We never really felt tired. And that was probably one of the most incredible and satisfying things about eating in Italy was, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you would be broke if you were in Italy, right? Cause you would never feel tired of eating. You would just be like, <laughs> shoot, I just had three cows and a lamb and I can get on the next thing. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's just different. I think that's really what it is, right? You're used to ingredients and qualities of ingredients that's that's local, more local to LA and mm. more regionally, and yeah. they get a source from a different region or higher uh, latitude. I don't know if that makes a difference, but I'd imagine just the climate, the types of produce they're able to grow, all sorts of factors go into the quality of food they consume versus the quality of food we consume. That's not to say that you can't get great pasta here. You know, we love the pasta at Bestia. Right. I personally enjoy pasta sisters. There's quite a few pasta places. There's just different of course. compared to what you get out there. Of course. Interesting. We bought a bunch of um, store-bought pasta to try uh -huh. cooking here. Oh, uh-huh. And, you know, we're tired, tired of the old Berea, Barilla, uh, that, that first blue box. This is because there's no other option except the, the grocery store's private brand. 
Um, so we bought a couple of just random bags. We didn't even know what the brands were. But in, if you, we tried to figure out what's a good brand of pasta, and it's really a lot of the articles mainly just talked about what was popular in mm. Italy, not necessarily rating the, the the texture or the flavor of the pastas. But something you'll see consistently is um, you want to look for a pasta that's high in protein content. So, yeah, unfortunately, everything's in the metric system. So all the pastas are in grams, but you want to look for about 14 grams, 12, 13 to 15 grams of protein. 100 grams of pasta mm. and fairly consistently i mean every package of pasta we looked at it's had at minimum 13 grams of protein so i was like well that didn't help me eliminate any choice <laughs> like going to your your local grocery store and it's like oh, i want to buy peanut butter okay here's 15 varieties of peanut butter pick poison kind of feels like that in italy with pasta you go to a grocery store even like a high-end grocery store there's just high, well right now high-end because you expect to have more variety but even like a um their equivalent of i don't know like a ralph's or bonds although they're never that size so significantly smaller but if you go to a grocery store out there there's like seven to ten brands to choose from so we bought i think we bought four different brands we've tried two of them now since we've been back oh, wow. and mm -hmm. it's uh, easily their pasta is better than our pasta. Really? Even okay. their store-bought pasta. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it takes 10 minutes to cook. It's a perfect al dente. It's got nice texture, nice firmness, um, neutral flavor, fairly neutral flavor. It's got, uh, it's just the right bite. So whatever you sauce it in, it just carries that sauce and it does what it needs to do. It's, it's a noticeable difference from what you can buy here. Well, what we were curious about was there is an Italy out in Italy, yeah. um, and we've got Italy out here in Culver City. So mm -hmm. once we make it through all of our pasta, we were curious to sing about Italy and see if we can find some of those non-Barilla brands and uh, okay. see how comparable they are to, to the stuff you can get over there in Italy. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be a good comparison. Um, what what are you uh, what are you cooking as far as, you know, what are you, your sauces and things with your pasta? What what are you topping them with? Uh, it's embarrassing to admit because it's going to be the same sauce the entire time. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we were in Cinque Terre, you know, Cinque Terre stands for it's it's short for five herbs or five lands, mm. um, and they're known for a handful of things. Cascia is one, anchovies are one, uh, but it's something they're known for is pesto. They say it's the birthplace of pesto. Oh, okay. So uh -huh. we took a pesto making class while we were out there. Okay. And since we've been back, we've been just dressing been making our pasta. pastas. <laughs> just pesto. Have you been making your own pesto, pesto like like at the, the, they've been showing you? You know. So I mean, for the most part, the way they showed us. Granted, when they showed us, you know, they gave us a mortar and a pestle, right, right, uh, to crush the, right. uh, the basil. The basil. And mm -hmm. at home, I use my Blendtec, <laughs> which is not quite a mortar and pestle. It's but will it blend? Faster. Of course. I mean, <laughs> no, but will it blend? So that, you know, it's, it's not a hundred percent replication because their, their variety of basil is this very cute, vibrant, small leaves basil plant and out here at Trader Joe's like the basil plant is the size of my fists so or sorry the leaves are the size of my fist um so it's not the same variety uh, but the flavor is is pretty it's pretty good yeah i i can't give you the recipe per se because i i don't know how to sure. measure it it's yeah. kind of just eyeballing and trying mm -hmm, to figure out mm -hmm. what consistency you like but all the pestos just basically consist of five six ingredients it's a good olive oil um Basil, obviously, pine nuts, some kind of cheese, usually a pecorino, uh, romano, mm. which is which is just a type of it's a sheep's milk cheese, pecorino, yeah. And then the romano it just means it's from Rome, and Toscana is from Tuscany. Tuscany, so yeah. Mm -hmm. That second word is just telling you where it's from. Um, so basil, oil, pine nuts, uh, cheese, salt, and garlic. Six ingredients. Very and then it goes in the blend tech and you just figure out, I mean, you just figure out how much oil, I probably the biggest, the trickiest thing is just oil. How much oil do you want to add? For it that, just depends on your preference. For the consistency yeah, the or problem, whatever. The, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. The problem with the blend tech is it's so powerful. <laughs> and 
because <laughs> I want my meal quickly. I will blend it at one of the highest RPM. Oh my! And so when it comes out, it's almost like a mousse. <laughs> I think the oil emulsifies. It becomes almost like a pesto mayonnaise. <laughs> Like, um, oh but, you know, once you get it onto a, a hot bowl of mm-hmm. freshly cooked pasta, yeah, you know, it'll it'll incorporate the oils will will kind of release into the the pesto. The cheese at the end of the pesto will melt into your pasta, and you just give it a quick mix, and it's super easy to do. Yeah, um, Trader Joe's has has right now they've got a ton of, of basil, yeah. um, so okay. it's super accessible. Um, and it's not really expensive. I mean, probably the most expensive ingredient is if you're buying quality olive oil, probably the olive oil. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And the cheese. Yeah. Actually, no, that's not true. The pine nuts are really expensive. All right. So the more I think about it, it's fairly pricey. <laughs> <laughs> fairly pricey thing to put together, but you're not using the whole bottom of olive oil and you're not using the whole wedge of cheese every time you're, you're making it. So. And you're really just adjusting the taste, and the pine nuts are really expensive. I mean, they were telling us even the pesto making class, the pine nuts they get from Pisa, mm-hmm. um, and per kilogram, it's more expensive for a kilogram of pine nuts than it is for a kilogram of gold. Oh my! I did not independently verify that, so if I'm misleading your your listeners, please fact check me. <laughs> it's usually my chat that does the fact checking here. Because I'm the one who spews okay, well, out the misinformation. So, so let me just misinform. And then when my child gets back, you can have them go through. And That's right. And, uh, and then in the next episode, before you guys get started, just offer all the correction. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll get on that. <laughs> this happens when you say T.O., my child. That's right. <laughs> you think you can get away from us, but... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, again. exactly. Okay. Um, so yeah, those are the three P's and obviously they've got other foods besides the three P's gelato being the biggest one. Uh, that comes to mind. We had a ton of gelato. Yeah. Um, kind of the same, same trend, you know, it's just, you don't feel super heavy after you have it. The serving sizes are reasonable. The pricing is very reasonable. Um, we went to Brom, which is over here in, I think is in century city, uh, gelato shop. Fairly pricey here, here, but over there it was about three three euro fifty mm. for uh, two two flavors of gelato. What was the name uh, of the place? Are, yeah, Grom G R O M. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Like prom, but delicious. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. So I think I mean we had gelato almost every day. Wow. Okay. It's two of the the most popular flavors that you'll find fairly consistently. Are going to be uh, hazelnut, okay, and pistachio. Why is that? And then I don't know. It must be a, a national nut. I don't know. We didn't look into that, but yeah. it's it's really easy to find those two flavors. And then they don't get too wild. It's not like a salt straw situation where they'll dump like crickets into your Halloween uh, ice cream. They don't get too crazy with flavors. Uh, some of them have banana flavor, which was really nice, fresh banana uh, yeah. flavor. Uh, in in Cinque Terre, so they're known for anchovies, they're known for uh, basil, they're known for focaccia, they're also known for their lemons. Mm. Um, so mm-hmm. one of the places had a, it's a lemon cream flavor, crema de limona. Wow. Limona? Uh, it's a lemon cream flavor. That was very nice. Okay. And then the other thing you'll tend to find pretty consistently at the gelaterias, gelaterias mm-hmm. at, uh, mm-hmm. in Italy are surveys. Um, so fruit based or based. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, strawberries, raspberries, pineapple, you name it. They've got, they've got a sorbet for it. And it's not quite like the stuff you find here. Uh, it's just a very nice, uh, pleasant texture mm. and then strong fruit flavor, but the fruit flavor tastes natural. It tastes like a fruit. Really? It doesn't taste okay. like you're eating something that a chemical engineer mm-hmm, had to mm-hmm. go and get a PhD and decide to figure out how to recreate the flavor of banana. Mm. They just use the banana. Just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. It turns out you don't need science. You can just go to the to the local farm and get some fruit and yeah. incorporate it into your dessert. Is uh yeah, so... is Grom like kind of the bigger like names out there as far as gelato goes or 
Ram is one. The other one is Venki, V E N C H I. My party noticed quite a few Venkis. I didn't notice it until the very last day, and it just so happened that I found them on on Google Maps because they're the closest one to my vicinity. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but there was a line out there, and that was probably the best gelato we had. Where is that Venki? And I don't know if there's any here stateside. Are you uh, are you doing um, the, the fact checking slash? I see one research? in uh, New York, I think. Oh, okay. Well, not here. Okay. Yeah, but not in LA. I'm not too surprised that there's some location in New York. Yeah, okay. it's a it's a chocolate shop and 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 a gelato. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's what's unique. Well, one of the unique things about them is they offer that, and then they offer like more foo foo cones and cups, so mm -hmm. you can get your your uh, waffle cone sprayed on the inside with chocolate and dipped some chocolate and oh, man. things like that. The other places are just cone or cup, and then you can get a waffle cone or a regular cone. So kind of what we're more used to here interesting they didn't give it the disneyland treatment no no i i wouldn't think so yeah they have uh they have class over there <laughs> <laughs> that's why we eat at disneyland <laughs> <laughs> the likes of us no of course class. no class um very and nice so we've covered kind of those major as I, I refer to them as food groups so we have a post we have the pastas <laughs> The pizza, um, yep. pinza is that what you said? Pinze, pinze, which is pinze. The flatbread. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, gelato, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So those are the major kind of food groups there. It seems. Those are the major food groups, and then the major beverage groups are wine. Okay, wine, wine. Yeah, yeah. They they had cocktails on their menu, but not everybody had cocktails. But consistently, wine and lots of coffee. Cappuccinos, oh, really? uh, uh, espresso shots. Cappuccinos are really intended to be consumed for in as breakfast because it has milk in it. Otherwise, you have an espresso shot or mm. or some kind of coffee, heavy coffee uh, with maybe water. If you're having like a an americano, although I don't, I think they probably frown upon you having an americano because it's just, why do you need to dilute your coffee? It's perfect as is. Why add water? Mm. Um, but coffee culture is huge. After every meal, they'll ask you if you want some coffee before you wrap up. Um, and the coffee there is very nice. Uh, we had quite a bit of coffee, and maybe it was a jet lag, but I didn't feel over-energized by the coffee we had. It felt like the right amount of caffeine, despite it being strong cups of coffee. Wow. So, okay. again, it's either us being hypnotized by the mysticism of this place or <laughs> something about the coffee just doesn't make you feel like that. I don't know which one it is, but. Wow. But it's, uh, it goes down nicely. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's a good way to start the morning and there's coffee shops all over the place. Fun fact, if you decide to have it there, they charge you a little more, but if you take it to go, they'll charge you less. Because oh. it's to cover for the table and things oh, like that. Interesting. That's what our uh, yeah. When we got there, we had a van drive us to our Airbnb. We got a van service because we had a bunch of luggage, and she was very chatty and gave us a lot of of, of tips and bits of information mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Italy, and that was one of them. The other thing is bathrooms. Bathrooms generally are pretty clean, um, and the bathrooms are everywhere because people drink coffee all the time. And oh, okay, when you have coffee, you got a bathroom. Yeah. Um, some places, you know, if you order something small, they'll let you use a restroom. And then there's also public restroom. Well, well maybe not public restrooms because a lot of the, some of the quote unquote public restrooms require you to pay one euro uh, to use them. Oh, so, uh -huh. right. That's something to bear in mind. You know, we tend to just use the restroom at the restaurants or if you're visiting a landmark, they usually had some kind of bathroom facility. Very nice. Good the to other know. thing she shared with us that was really interesting was she, she told us specifically that. The lines on the roads mm -hmm. are merely suggestions <laughs> in Rome. And that when they paved over the roads and it was completely black, they just thought, you know, it'd be nice to put some decorative elements in there. So that's what the lines are for. But they're merely suggestions. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, driving in Rome is no joke. Uh, just watching her navigate. I mean, it was a big van. I think it was almost the size of a Fortress. It was like a Mercedes Sprinter van. That we okay, yeah. Like a, almost like cargo and, size. Yeah, yeah, almost cargo size. Super tight roads. Yeah. 
Um, you know, obviously not made for cars, especially big cars, but she was mm-hmm. able to navigate those corners, get through the city, um, squeeze to really tight places without any any hassles and any scratches or bumps or anything like that. So I was very impressed. Yeah, they all they all have a really good understanding of the dimensions of their cars, except when yeah. it comes to parking, I guess, because that's when <laughs> all the stuff's happening. <laughs> but I mean, they park very close to one another too, right? So that's something that was maybe different from what I used to do. So here yeah. in LA, where you have a little more space, you give people more space in front behind you. Over there, it's like if you got space to creep up, you're gonna creep up as close as you can creep up that far yeah. ahead of you. Yeah. And I can't imagine how long it takes to get out of a parking spot. No, it'd be kind of a nightmarish for for us, for our, our kind here. It'd be crazy. Oh yeah, no, we would we would be kicking and screaming and probably would scratch the other car and hopefully people are honest enough to leave a note, but that's that's it's just a different culture, a different mm-hmm. way they look at their cars versus how we look at our cars. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. Well good to know. You know, so we um we've talked a lot again about different foods, different food groups good examples of, you know, what you've had. Uh, I just want to go through, maybe you kind of identify a few kind of things and maybe you'll repeat some of the things you've already mentioned, but let me just start. Um, what would you say is the favorite and the least favorite items that you've had? Um, you know, among everything, if you could like name one, you know, one of each there. Favorite and least favorite items. Do we do like a worth it winner? Go at one different price points. What is uh, some of the best foods? If that works for you. If that works for you, go for it. I'll try. Um, I mean, on the high end, we did do one Michelin star restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was called San San Jacopo. Okay. Let me look for this place. And uh, what kind of uh, restaurant was this? It was a <laughs> very. It was just pinces and wine, <laughs> just elevated pince, taco jet, everything. Things kind of wrapped in a bubble. Yeah, I don't know why I can't find it in our itinerary. I think it was San Jacopo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so but, what is uh, it? What was. Did, mm-hmm. I mean. It was all, you know, the chef was very playful with the menu. So there was a tasting, it was a tasting menu and they had a summer menu and then their regular tasting menu. So I believe we had their regular tasting menu. I could be wrong, uh, but I believe we had a regular tasting menu and it was just a variety of things. We had mm. different, uh, let's see, we started with um, some appetizers. So it was uh, it was bread with a slice of basically it was pork fat, which mm. is a slice Ooh. of lard. Excellent. But it was super flavorful. Uh, didn't feel like you were eating something extremely unhealthy. Like it felt reasonable to be eating. Um, we had turbo, which is a fish dish. We had some. I don't know. It was almost like the equivalent of a turducken, except just Italian style. So just different animals wrapped into um, a casing that they had. I think it was in a pigskin that they had for stub. So almost like lechon on the outside, but then Italian flavors on the inside. That was really nice. Um, what else did they have? We had the, the best thing that we had there. Everybody raved about the palate cleanser they gave us before dessert. Mm. And the palate cleanser was, I mean, it was, everything was a work of art, but uh, the palate cleanser was this pineapple. It was like a very thinly cut pineapple, almost like sashimi pineapple that they wrapped around. I, I would have to guess maybe some kind of cream cheese or, or like a milk based um, mm. item. And then there was different um, citrus elements to it and floral elements very very nice great palate cleanser i would have been happy just having palate cleanser all night and not eating any of the dessert <laughs> okay. it was good too yeah but that was just it was just very refreshing a very nice uh way to prepare that pineapple pear yeah um but yeah it was just a very imaginative uh, menu uh as you could expect from a michelin star and it didn't feel very pretentious you know some of the michelin star places that we've been to even at the one michelin star level some of them feel a little pretentious uh really okay uh, the way they talk about things the way they they point things out and they interact with you this felt like no frills 
you know, enjoy this experience. Yeah, it's different from what you're used to dining in a regular dining environment. Yeah, it is a uh, higher level of service, but it didn't feel overly oppressive or it didn't feel like they were watching you too closely or they feel like you're being monitored by Big Brother as you attempted to eat whatever it was that yeah. the chef came up with. Okay. Um, but that was that was up there as a favorite. So that's that's at the the high end of the price point. Okay. Um, Fakasha in Manarola, which is one of the towns in uh, Cinque Terre, that was really nice. The place called Pia de Campu, and it's just a it's a cute little place on the rooftop. Uh, you know, they're known for lemon trees, so they've got lemon trees growing in their backyard or in the in the space, the dining space. They've got string lights going through, so we went out there for dinner. Um, they had a, a tasting menu of or a flight of their, their white wines from the region. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had uh, just a variety of focaccias um, topped with various... Oh, yeah, you found it. Impressive. Um, much prettier at night, so you got to keep scrolling. So you oh, can yeah, see we'll find the ones, ones. sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 but that was, uh, it's, wow. it's almost like a giant pinte, but yeah. the conscious style. Right, right. Um, not particularly expensive. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember how much that cost. I think it was like 20, 15, 20 euros maybe for one of those uh, focaccias, but that feeds four or two people. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so we got, we got two of those and you get to choose a flavor on each, two flavors on each one or two toppings and that flavor on each one um their dessert maybe not as strong because they they keep le- they lean hard on focaccia so it was a focaccia and nutella not that it was bad but it's literally a focaccia with nutella <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah take that for what you will yeah but very nice uh, those are probably the two that stick out the most i mean you know all the pastas are really good there isn't really anything that i would say was quote unquote better than the other they all had great mm. so, and then um Cinque Terre is also known for seafood so we had a really nice um seafood uh like a tomato based seafood stew quote unquote and it's just a, a mixed variety of clams and uh shrimps and things like that in this stew that was that was also really nice probably three standout things okay well how about some things that didn't stand out as much <laughs> Uh, that can be hard. Your 12 viewers are probably going to blast you for this, for having me here and saying this, but there's a, there's a, a Florentine steak place. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's called, is it one moment while I consult my itinerary that I did not assist <laughs> in compiling. So this is going to take a while to find. Let's see. It was when we were in Florence and we had dinner at Trattoria dal Oste. Okay. This is a steakhouse and, you know, it's very, it's a Florentine steak uh, place. Mm-hmm. And I think Florence is known for those steaks and the way they prepare it is, the way it's intended to be enjoyed is rare, medium rare, um, okay. just cooked on an open fire. So yeah. this place sells porterhouse um, cuts. They've got other cuts too, but they're known for their porterhouse, porterhouse. cuts. Okay. Okay. Which, is, which is New York on one side and a filet on the other side. Mm. And it's really well-reviewed. TripAdvisor, we had friends who had visited Italy before we had, raved about this place. Multiple friends who visited it before we did rave about yeah. this place. There's YouTubers sure. out there, I want to name names, so I don't want them to flame your channel, but they uh, they raved about this place as well. Yeah. Um, not good. No, yeah, probably the most disappointing meal we had. <laughs> oh, my God. Extremely disappointing. <laughs> Wow. Um, you know, I think it was the, it could have been a bad cut. Uh, two things that rubbed me the wrong way at this place. Really pretentious place. Uh, really, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not relative to what you would pay out here for a cut of meat uh, of that size. It probably is comparable, if not cheaper. So we had a 2.8 kilogram cut of uh, porterhouse that's been dry aged. Uh, so that's roughly four pounds, mm-hmm. uh, give or take, and that was like a hundred and ten euros. Whereas you think about like going to a Mastro's, you know, and you get like a fillet. A fillet is like sixty dollars right. for one right. person. Mm-hmm. So this was enough to, to share with four cooked media, uh, cooked rare, 
Um, and it was just really tough. It was, it was a battle. It's like the cow wasn't cooked enough and it fought back when you tried to eat it. It was yeah. very unpleasant. Yeah. Um, the flavor was okay. The slay side definitely was better than the New York side. New York side was really, really a, a, a battle to get through. So that was one disappointment was, was this, the steak that we had. We were super excited about it. And I think we all came away being a bit, uh, underwhelmed, mm-hmm. even disappointed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that was disappointing was the way they served their wine, okay. which sounds strange, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? How, how do you serve wine in a strange way? Okay. They just, just pour it in the glass, which is typically what every everybody else did. They either poured it in the glass and handed it to you, right. or they had already poured it at the kitchen or at the bar and brought it to you. This place brought four wine glasses. They placed it on a little table you know, like a little uh, collapsible table next to you. And then your waiter is like, oh, hello, welcome. He speaks perfect English, so you know it's a touristy spot. <laughs> like perfect English. Uh, there's not a bit of Italian to, to his his uh, accent at all. Not to mention, I think he was Indian or Southeast Asian, so definitely not Italian. Interesting. Okay. Um, but we ordered a bottle of wine, brought it to us, let one of our... our uh, uh, travel buddies, uh, taste it. We said, cool, good. He said, great. And then normally once you say good to go, it's not cork. It's not about, it hasn't gone bad. They'll just pour your wine glasses and leave you be. This guy poured maybe a tablespoon or so of wine into one wine glass. And then he tipped it to the point where it almost poured out of the glass. Then he started to twirl it like a cement mixer to coat the entire glass surface, okay, the interior glass surface with wine. Hmm. It's almost like he was trying to, I don't know, ensure that it was evenly coated with wine before he then took whatever wine was in that glass, poured it into the next glass, and repeated this process until all four wine glasses were done. I can't imagine if you went there with a party of 12, would you have to literally sit there and wait for this guy mm-hmm, to coat mm-hmm. 12 glasses of wine before you finally got to have it? But I mean, you know, we've been to, we've been fortunate enough to have been to, have been to a few Michelin star places. We've been to some, you know, quote unquote, foofier places here in LA. Mm-hmm. Never in my lifetime of dining has anybody seized into my wine glass with the wine I'm about to drink. <laughs> so that was a really strange experience that did not help at all with a dining experience it, it was one of the first things they did and definitely put a, a, a strange note in our yeah in our mouths and then as soon as we had the steak we're like this is this is two strikes wow that's surprising so, i think that is very surprising yeah very surprising it's very contrarian to what everybody else says about this place so i'm, I'm my guess is it was probably a bad cut. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it is very well reviewed up and down TripAdvisor, Google, Yelp, yeah. word yeah. of mouth, YouTube, friends. Everybody gives it, gives it uh, rave reviews, but yeah. I'm giving it two questionable thumbs in a sideways fashion. Very interesting. I would not revisit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's too bad. Um, it's just interesting uh, that, yeah, not everything is always as cracked up. Uh, to be um okay well i guess we'll pay a visit to black angus then and uh we'll <laughs> <laughs> yes let's get there dry age. <laughs> oh man okay all right well that seems to really stand out as maybe not uh one of one of the most favorable you know kind of things i am curious though um would you say that was the most expensive meal that you had um or the maybe... the the steakhouse yeah the steakhouse no or the most expensive meal would have been the michelin star the meal. michelin star okay okay yeah and what about the uh the cheapest the cheapest meal that you had it's kind of hard to say i mean like a singular item i guess i don't know i mean what constitutes a meal yeah at this point i don't know because we had like for example we had a uh, coffee and a pastry one mm-hmm. morning and to me, that felt like a meal. To you, it's probably an insult um, to have just that amount of food and be satisfited. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, How much the that? cheapest thing we had was 
Uh, it was three euros for a cappuccino and then six euros for, they call it a cornetto, which kind of looks like a, a, uh, a croissant. Mm. And then it's filled with more rocket salad, more cold cuts, maybe cheese. Yeah. Um, that was six euros. So oh. was that the cheapest thing? Cause Al Antico sandwiches were, I think yeah, seven euros or higher. I think that was the cheapest thing. Uh, we did when we were on the train to, um, we were on the train to Milan. We did pick up some grocery store bought pizzas and focaccia. That's probably was the cheapest meal we had. I think yeah. the focaccia was five four euros in the the grocery store. From the grocery yeah, they're store. All, yeah, the Carrefour uh -huh. is their is one of their their uh, grocery store chains. Mm -hmm. And so when we were in the train station, um, going from Cinque Terre to Milan, we had a quote unquote layover at, uh, I think it was the town called Lavanto. Mm -hmm. And there's not much around near that train station. You know, you go to the train station in Rome and it's massive, sprawling, complex, tons of restaurants. You arrive at the train station in Milan, massive, sprawling, complex, ton of restaurants. Levanto, very, very small. I think three platforms, maybe four. Mm -hmm, four mm -hmm. platforms total. Um, one restaurant, which is not really a restaurant, it's a cafe. It's, it's a convenience store. So yeah, we, we didn't want to eat chips for breakfast. So uh, I picked up some some uh, some focaccia and, and a, a small personal-sized pizza that we had shared amongst ourselves uh, at the local care floor. And I think that was probably four euros maybe for each of those items. Really good though, surprisingly, for especially for a grocery store. The focaccia was really nice, um, and the uh, the the little pizza was fine. Just pizza. It's it's Rome. It's Italian style pizza. Okay. All right. It actually tasted more similar to something you might find in our grocery store to go mm -hmm. pizza uh, pizza item. Interesting. Oh, the other thing that I did not really enjoy was there was another focaccia place in Manarola. Mm -hmm. that you know i just so when we did our pesto making class uh it was on this part of the island where there it's a very small piece of land it's a very narrow but long piece of land beautiful view of the ocean or of this of the mediterranean but um no space for a kitchen so the food that you got served was almost like a charcuterie board um but unlike a charcuterie where you have a variety of meats the only variety of meat is prosciutto um, <laughs> very good prosciutto but just crazy volume of it so it was a, a giant cutting board full of prosciutto there were some of the best cantaloupe we've ever had yeah um there was a burrata salad in there uh what other elements a couple of pieces of bruschetta and then the rest of it was prosciutto and there was a ton of prosciutto and then when we finished the burrata salad and removed the bowl that was sitting on top of the prosciutto it turns out I thought they had just piled the prosciutto onto the, the board so that it was forming a moat around this bowl. No, when you remove this bowl of burrata underneath it, turns it was more prosciutto. So we just couldn't finish it all between the two of us. So I stopped by a focaccia place to, to get some focaccia to accompany the remaining prosciutto that I could mm -hmm. not eat. Mm -hmm. And the focaccia was just very heavy, very oily. Yeah, it, it was really? olive oil. Wow. Focaccia. Yeah, and it was just... It was maybe a little too much. You know, the, the olive oil was nice. It was a nice flavor, but it was just too much of it. Uh, so that was probably one of the other items that was not as as uh, appealing. Interesting. Okay. Oh, you know what? The pince. That <laughs> very first pince. How many, how many of these things do you normally ask people for that they didn't enjoy? <laughs> yeah, the pince was a, a rough start to pince, okay. at least. Okay. So those three things. But hopefully it kind of... The first being say, I see, yeah. but hopefully it redeemed itself over time, you know, with other places that you visited. We had one more being say, we said we're not being say, and it moved on. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So now it's back to uh, uh, Little Caesars and DiGiorno here. So I don't think I can, at least I'm gonna need some time. <laughs> yeah, DiGiorno is tricky because it has an Italian sounding name, so you think it's it's like the pizza in, in Italy, but I suspect it's not going to be similar. Well, you know, it's not delivery. Right. It's, it's DiGiorno. <laughs> well, I don't want to end on such a uh, 
a low note, note. But, but I I think from from all the foods that you sure? what's wrong with the sure? no. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with them. But from all the the foods that you have mentioned, you know the standouts and everything. If there's a food that you could go back, um, when you, if or when you do go back, that you could have again, right? Immediately, as soon as you get off the plane or whatever, uh, what what would that be? Either specific dish or or restaurant. Pasta and a sandwich, a panino. Panino. Yeah, a sandwich. Oh, okay. I'd be happy having. I'd be happy having either pasta or a panino. Uh, from any particular place or just, um, I mean, we had pasta from several places and they were all good. There was nothing to complain about. And then I only had sandwiches from that one place, but there was a couple other places that was on the itinerary, but didn't get a chance to try, mm. uh, but similar style where, you know, flatbread, pulled cut, rocket salad spreads, but those are, I, if we had more time, I would have spent more time eating. Okay. Sandwiches. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Okay. You have any other kind of uh, uh, last thoughts for uh, for our listeners? Closing arguments. Uh, <laughs> if you get a chance, I would highly recommend checking it out, especially if you're a big fan of Italian food. Yeah. Turns out, pasta is a it's quite a magical food over there. Mm, okay. uh, and you know, there's I mean, Italy is massive. There's a lot to check out. We only did a handful of, of places. Uh, we did make it out to wine country for a day in Tuscany. Mm. Um, that was really beautiful too. Had a great meal there. Oh, how did I not? I forgot about that one. Uh -oh. Had a great meal at, at the at the vineyard, which was really strange. I wasn't expecting to have a nice meal at a vineyard. Usually, it's just wine tasting. I'm like, you get paired with maybe some finger foods, but this was a full on meal. Mm. Um, Where was uh, it? Sorry. Yeah, it was in Tuscany, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the vineyard was Avignonesi. Okay. Good luck. Uh, uh, fact checking that. Yeah. Avignonesi. I do, Avignonesi. I do see it, which is nice. Um, yeah, they've got a really nice kitchen. Uh, where, uh, you know, they've got a, a proper chef there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had a really nice, really, really nice summertime menu. A lot of fresh fruits. You know, they've got their own, in addition to growing grapes, uh, they've got their own garden where they grow a lot of the produce that they serve there. And it's, it's very fresh, very different interpretation on certain dishes and was overall really nice. Wow. Semi Fredo type of dessert they have out there. Semi Fredo is like semi soft or uh, semi frozen. Okay. Uh, like a softer ice cream. That's not gelato. That was really nice. Yeah. There was actually quite a lot. I mean, if you're asking me to recap 36 meals, I can't. I'm not going to be able to, to be particularly helpful. I see. But in general, we had great experiences dining out in Italy. And, for a real, you know, we were expecting to spend much more on mm -hmm. food in Italy. And we were pleasantly surprised uh, how much it came out to be. So check yeah. it out. That's well, fine. That's just another reason. Yeah. Just another reason to, you know, try it out. Maybe go back. Yeah. And, uh, and get some sure. more. And a pasta. Yeah. That's the place to be. Yeah. If you enjoy gelato, it's a place to be. Okay. Okay, good. Good. Well, thank you very much, John. I really uh, appreciate all the, the knowledge and the tips and everything you've uh, you've shared with us today. I hope uh, hope our listeners kind of glean some good info. And um, yeah, I hope we didn't wear you down too much. Um, I thought... Uh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> like I don't know. Mentally, I didn't even talk as much at work. <laughs> I mean, you've been just talking. I mean, as soon as you got on, I knew you were already, it's already downhill from there. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. As soon as you made the introduction and tried to recall, <laughs> we're like, oh, man. this was a regretful decision. I know. Exactly. Well, that's how my job feels every time. See, he has to go through that every week, <laughs> whatever. That's why he's, he's taking time off. So, <laughs> right. Time off is really right. just a mental health break. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Just trying to mend his, his psychological health. That's right. Um, well, thanks again. I hope, uh, I don't know, hopefully, I wonder if you'd uh, consider to come back on for more of your adventures and trips or things. Uh, um, but, you know, for now, I mean, hopefully you've you've really shared a lot and I'm sure our listeners uh, are really down to try out um, or at least take a look at what you've shared. So um, 
you know, from all I could say, um, buongiorno, right? Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we've come. To, but we've come to you too. <laughs> to to you too. Well, it sounds like we've come to the end of another episode. So thank you for joining us. We're excited to bring you more of our adventures with good food and good people. Uh, you can reach out to us at Instagram. I'm at Dumb and Hungry. Uh, when my chow is uh, not dead to us, he's at my underscore chow. You can also reach us by email at hi at dumbandhungry.com where you can leave us your feedback and your love letters. You can find the videos here on YouTube. Won't you like and subscribe and smash? You can also find the audio here on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else fine podcasts are served. But until next time, I'm Angelo. I'm not Michael. And on your next food adventure, remember to try one of each. Oh,